My guest this week is Ralph Moore. Ralph has been working in electronic music for over 25 years and was the staff writer of Music Magazine, where he interviewed everyone from Depeche Mode and New Order to Pet Shop Boys and the Chemical Brothers. In 2004, he joined MixMag, where he's still on the masthead 20 years later. And he's currently writing about his life in dance music for Velocity Press and is helping the legendary DJ and producer Sasha write his life story for White Rabbit Books. Moore also does the remix a r for the Pet Shop Boys and also worked with Tears for Fears on their reissued Head Over Heels Record Store Day single release. He is also an artist manager, currently working with DJ and record producer legends Harry Romero and Ida Enberg. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome to Revolutions Per Movie, Ralph Moore. Hi, Ralph. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. It's five o'clock here. Your, your morning, my afternoon. Yeah, I know. Thank you for acknowledging this. I appreciate that. Really thrilled to talk to you about the film that you picked, Amy, from 2015, directed by Asif Kapadia. We were talking earlier before we started about how the perception of Amy Winehouse discovering her in the U.S. versus the U.K. So when did you first come across Amy Winehouse? Did you hear about her? Did you read about her? It was definitely her her first album, Frank. There were a few sort of jump off points for me. I was working for Mix Mag full time. And while she was definitely being marketed as a jazz artist, there were also a bunch of remixes. So there'd be like mix, remixes by people like Milo and MJ Cole alongside the original radio edit. She was she was nominated for a few awards, but not, nothing around that debut album quite got her to the level that obviously the world knew her for. So it was almost it was almost a bit like the first Radiohead album that it's, it's sort of a fair analogy. Like the, the insiders knew about them. A, there wasn't a paranoid Android on the first Amy Winehouse album, like the second album had rehab. Right. I'm going to continue with this Radiohead analogy for a minute because it, it is useful because ultimately you can sort of say that Radiohead have ended up being one of one. And I would, I would, you know, I would die on a hill that said Amy Winehouse was a very similar one of one, like a once in a generational talent, really. But yeah, it wasn't that that first album. Frank had some singles that, that did quite well, but, you know, nothing on it blew up. That doesn't mean that it wasn't really good because it was really good. But, you know, she was a she felt like a really a really homegrown talent. And I'm sure that she was sort of bouncing around Europe. Um, but obviously, we're going back to a point where there's no social media. So you're 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 relying on grassroots shows. You're relying on radio programmers to support singles. And, you know, and, and yeah, really, it's it's radio. It was radio and media that was driving uh the story as well as the label you know doing the right interviews Jules Holland was a big early champion of Amy Winehouse I was invited to a very very early listening session um for Back to Black and remember listening to it once and just it blew my head off just in that one play I could I could tell just how well it had been put together like it it as a sort of piece of art it's it's a peerless, really well curated album. A big part of that is Mark Ronson, but he didn't do the whole record, right. right? So he did some of it, but definitely he produced some of the moments that, um, you know, the the world now knows. But then beyond the album, there there was he also put her on his own album, and they did that cover of the Zootons' Valerie. And although that wasn't her song, weirdly, I'd say that's probably one of the most famous songs that she's associated with um one of the things that the film um makes quite clear is that she actually wasn't really a fan of that club disco version she preferred the sort of slowed down version of the song but ultimately it's a bit like what what we you know we knew her for certain songs of her own but then she was also a very good interpreter of other people's Absolutely. material and that's where you know a song like that really came into its own frank is such a traditional jazz sounding record for the time was there a jazz scene going on that was quite prominent or was she just on her own in that scene i don't particularly remember her being part of a jazz scene i just know that everybody associated her with you know the camden scene so whether that was okay indie acts you know 
like the Liber- I think she was friends with the Libertines and th- and artists like that, but you wouldn't compare them musically, really. And that's like the Trash Club, right? That era. Yeah, yeah. the The dance mixes that came out of that first record, like I think MJ Cole remix, um, "F Me Pumps." Mm-hmm. We're gonna keep this PG. Um, <laughs> we can go. We can go R. It's fine. <laughs> It's Amy Winehouse. Um, we're talking. I think she'd appreciate it if we went R. I guess what we're what we're talking about in this era is you know their ele- their electro remixes, right? So there would be there'd be broken beat like Bugs in the Attic, but mainly if you wanted to get your records played at places like Trash or in uh-huh. East London clubs, you gave them a bit of Milo, or you gave them something that sort of elevated the song to a, to a two a.m. Um, you know record rather than say an early evening radio record. Right. I mean, you, you you have to, you have to hand it to Mark Ronson. He will probably look at Amy the way that Quincy Jones looks at MJ, really. Like you only come, you only end up with this sort of incredible magic once, maybe twice in a lifetime yeah. where you're in the right place. And um, the records define, you know, they define a generation. I, I know quite a lot of the people behind the scenes at Ireland and 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 at this documentary and the same this you know I think uh although I'm not going to sort of say who said what um one person who works at the label felt that this was a very honest representation of and a snapshot of what was going on now we mentioned that I I before we started recording that there's a there's another documentary called reclaiming amy and that's really interesting because both the mum and dad say we've made this as a reaction to amy particularly the dad the dad says that he had uh, a nervous breakdown unfortunately after having seen it the film is unflinchingly honest and i watched it with the good old director's cut commentary and they're not trying to romanticize her life or the addictions in her life. I think that they feel that their job is to be forensic rather than uh, biased, say, towards anyone in her life. So I don't I, even Blake, who I think became a bit of a media target. He isn't necessarily shot by gunshot in this film. And the other thing that you've got is because it's most of the footage in it is before the world of social media. Yes. The stuff that is being recorded is on basically video cameras or tripod cameras or, but, but it's not only later on, do you get anything approaching an early iPhone video? And then even that it's sort of very sparing. So what you end up having is a lot of information where Blake is filming Amy and she's looking at the camera directly to you watching it but actually she's doing it for him so it has a double double meaning of of how you sort of look at it there's no question that they were completely and utterly head over heels for each other and couldn't live without each other no the choice is to use the it's not even archival footage it's personal footage or else it's footage shot by people who were being voyeuristic about her and like you know walking down the street or across the street or yeah. in a restaurant or coming out and they've had to acquire this footage to put in this documentary about, you know, the scene kind of eating her, you know, and just the paparazzi. So it's, it's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle, isn't it? It's incredible. And watching it again, you know, I hadn't seen it in a while. I just forgot how much of the film is really the struggle, you know, her, her addictions and stuff. Rather than I just was like, oh, the music part is very small. Can you separate an artist from their personal story? Or is that just part of being a public figure? I think that, interestingly, we've gone through a shift, whereas as a man in his 40s, you could definitely like an artist like, say, Michael Jackson or a hip-hop artist who might be problematic without... You, 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 you wouldn't stop listening to an artist in the 90s just because they'd done something that either was terrible you might you might the point i'm trying to make is now people vote with their feet on these things so interestingly now if you if you are say r kelly say or someone in that sphere 
where it's undeniable. I think not only are radio programmers less likely to play the music on the radio, but also because so many people now align music with the morals and the ideas of their favourite artists, that if you've done something that object that they find objectionable, it's quite likely that their streaming numbers are going to plummet as a result. Now, so I guess what, what was happening, even in the height of Amy Winehouse, you know, tabloid frenziness, even if she missed a gig, people weren't going to suddenly go, right, that's it. We're never going to play Frank ever again. Right. They just, it just wasn't, it wasn't that way. Um, in many ways, because things were less about, <laughs> it was no streaming. It was iTunes, CD, vinyl. Right. You had it. You had it. And you weren't really making a uh, a moral standpoint um, on you, and you certainly couldn't talk about how you feel and feel empowered by either playing or not playing something. You, you know, it wasn't it wasn't anywhere near the level of political um, support that you'd have now. So I went to a few Amy Winehouse shows. I remember she played at Best of All, and it wasn't amazing. And I do remember people booing. And while there was a little bit of a hubbub the next day, people were not burning their CDs or cracking the vinyl as a result of that show. It was a talking point. Um, and I definitely remember people thinking, you know, this is a this is a waste of, of um, time and talent that, sure. you know, you're being given a platform and you're messing this up. But as we sort of see in the film, there's no... This is it. This is a ship going into uncharted waters. Really, it's it's a film about addiction, and I do actually think that the record label, towards the end, did a very very good job of saying, "Go and get yourself better." You know, there's that letter from Lucy and Grange who, who, um, makes it clear that she needs to get off of drugs. Yeah, she can't go to the Grammys. Yeah. Yeah. The. The, you know, the wider label definitely weren't trying to exploit her while she had those troubles towards the end. But she'd also become arguably the most famous woman in the world. Uh, you know, it was so weirdly uh, ferocious, the tabloid attention around her. And of course, every time she opened the door and left her house, something would happen. Someone would goad her. Um she'd look strange or she'd lash out or not lash out but the the tabloid's job was to get a, to get a rise out of her i think this film is probably the best documentation of what it must feel like to have never ending flash bulbs go off as you walk down a street at night it is so upsetting i'm surprised she didn't strike out more it is yep. it's just the film really um viscerally captures just how claustrophobic and painful that must have been. And obviously what we're seeing as well is some of the things that she's trying to leave the house to do, which would be go and see her husband, um, yeah. try and do something, is very, very different to, I guess, what most people with a nine to five job would experience. But it got worse and worse as time went on because it was the absolute peak of the evil tabloid media circus where they just didn't, they didn't have to answer to anyone, did they? So none of them were going home telling their wives that Amy Winehouse had lamped them or that they, that they pushed her too far. No one, there's, there's, it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is everyone just accepted that the tabloids were there and you had to deal with it. That was kind of the right. borderline of what was going on. Now I think you look back at it and you're horrified to see how far they push things. Well, same with the comedians. I mean, the first thing I ever saw her on was a bootleg copy of Nevermind the Buzzcocks. And, you know, she's, you know, a, a mess on the show, but they're just so unforgiving. And it seemed yes. like comedians, you know, Frankie Boyle. and Yeah, that one was particularly, that one was particularly vile. Yeah, but people are laughing. It's like, at the they time, are. they're like, it's just part of the public consciousness that like, oh, Amy Winehouse, she's a mess and she's, she's fucked up. 
So we're going back. We're going back fifteen years, aren't we? Yeah. Really? So I guess the other thing that we both get to see here, talking about it, is we are seeing a fairly honest snapshot of of not only her life but how the media landscape treated people that they wanted that they thought were fair game you know um it's 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 princess diana levels of you cannot leave the house without being chased down the street or or something happening um she really was at one point the most famous female musician in the world right you you'd possibly give that to taylor swift in a sort of similar level of world fame yeah 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 um but no one would dare treat taylor with this level of sort of vile um intrusion it's it's heartbreaking isn't it really yeah and amy was so open with the press too she's just like I don't want to be a star. I just want to do my music. Well, there's a section where she says, you know, success to me is having the freedom to work with whoever I want to work with to always just be able to fuck everything off and go to the studio when I have to go to the studio. An interviewer says, but you can't do that nowadays because you have other responsibilities. You're becoming an artist in the public eye. And she says, leave me alone and I'll do it. I'll make the music. I just need time to do the music. And she's just really honest with people. She's like, just let me do my thing. Leave me alone. She didn't ex- She didn't see it coming, did she? There's a bit at the beginning where they talk about that. And it's almost like, oh, what are you gonna, what's it going to be like once you become really famous? And she doesn't see it coming. The second album was a perfect storm. It had a lead single, which was autobiographical with, by the way, the artwork and the marketing around that second album. It's like the album cover is absolutely, you know, it's an overused word to say it's iconic, but it's so iconic. Uh, it really, it's like actually iconic rather than like hashtag iconic. You know, my mum who died last year was a music teacher. And when she started asking me about Amy Winehouse, I just thought, okay, this has just hit a whole different level. Um, I wondered whether you could use a sort of point of, reference to other female artists who've who experienced you know this level of tragedy I I was thinking about Sinead O'Connor because I read her autobiography recently and watched the doc and the success of Nothing Compares to You is not in any way good for her mental health and she certainly doesn't celebrate it um for anyone who hasn't read the book yet she goes in quite hard on old fluffy club of fluffy cuffs as she calls Prince and when they meet, it's not a joyous thing, right? They end up having some kind of like weird fight. So it's not, that's not great. She definitely doesn't see him ever again. But it also sends her life off into a direction that she didn't want. She didn't want to be public property. Um, she didn't want to make another record uh, that that had that level of impact, not just on you know, how many units she she shifted, but like the expectation. So I think with what you're also seeing with Amy is once you've been on stage with the Rolling Stones at the Isle of Wight, once you've sold out all of your UK tour, once you, you know, once you've done all the things which you probably mentally had in your head as I hope we can play this place one day. Sure. You end up becoming a bona fide, um, you become a juggernaut that can headline any festival in the world. And that's sort of what we see as well. Um, I flew to St. Lucia. So it would have been 2009, 2010. She headlined the St. Lucia Jazz Festival and it rained. It thundered it down, but she did come on, but she only played half the show. I, I think she just got too drunk and wasn't able to finish the show. So the band did exactly what you see in this sometimes which is they're aware that they she's on stage but she's decided or there's a switch has gone which is i don't want to play anymore or no i'm I'm not playing i'm not playing ball and so the band continue to play and this is exactly what what i saw in st lucia the band continue but she's not then jumping in for the chorus she's just but they have to keep going because they've been paid and they're headlining right and this went on and on and on. And of course, then you get the booze again. But back to your the, your question about, 
you know how it's changed people were disappointed but i guess they i guess in a weird way they also weren't surprised that this is what happened because it was just a uh, her her entire life by this point was drama she'd been sent to st lucia to get off of um class a drugs but as they mentioned in the film those drugs were replaced by alcohol yes and that and her dad showing up to make a reality yeah. tv show like you know we we talked about the fact that they're after this um and i watched it recently there's a there's a, an, a, a i guess the family clap back which is called reclaiming amy and her dad says that he had uh, a nervous breakdown after seeing the film now if you look at the credits for the film it's absolutely a universal endorsed production uh executive producer david joseph well he runs universal over here in the uk the you know all the all the music which as you know when you make docs and the people don't want you to use it they just don't let you use it this has everything right so this has been completely um approved and i think everyone was i i remember going to see this on a monday uh, at my local cinema at the picture house and just walked out going, that was incredible. It was so searingly honest when I first saw it. I couldn't believe um, it had come through like that because, you know, as a writer myself, you you tend to romanticise things and forget the bad bits. But this just, <laughs> as we know, <laughs> doesn't, this is unflinchingly honest. The stuff that we don't know about, you know, as a fan of her, you know, when they cut to uh, Nick Shemansky's wedding, even that yes. heartbreaking. Yes. There's a lot in it that you didn't know that even if you knew a lot about her, you'd still get a lot out of it. Because sometimes I watch things or I listen to things, and I'm sure you do too, where you go, OK, I didn't really learn that much from that one. Oh, absolutely. This This film has no talking heads in it. And it's told chronologically through footage, like you said, that is mostly Amy trusting the people who are filming her, like Nick or her best friend Jules or her husband, Blake. She trusts the person who's filming it. Yeah. And then the other footage is from strangers trying to get what they can out of her. And I think that it walks such a fine line between, I think the fact that it starts out and it's all like, Nick, her manager, teasing her while she's trying to sleep in the back of a car or her being like, don't film me. You're getting my spots. Yeah. You know, you're getting my acne. Stop. It's like being a parent and following around your kid with a camera back then where it's not on your phone, but you're just like, all right, I'm just going to film everything and I'm not even going to know what I filmed. Right. And the fact that they got access to this and so much trust to tell this story is really incredible. And I, I can't think of many films like this. Again, with the documentary on, they talked about how they had to build trust with certain people. So like Salam uh, Remy in, in Miami was not an instant yes. Sure. It took a while. He had to build the trust. So I do think this is an honest film. The one thing it didn't talk about, and this is where I pull out one of my um, endless gig tickets, is I remember going to this show. It was at Shepherd's Bush Empire and it's, Friday the 9th of March, 2007. I remember going to £17.50. I mean, if that was, if she was alive now, that would be a £500 ticket. It would be a Dell price now. Oh, absolutely. £17.50, mental. Uh, yeah. That's very quaint. <laughs> I remember thinking as I walked in, there is nowhere else in the world I'd rather be than at this Amy Winehouse concert. And I think that, I remember that her dad was there. She was absolutely on fire. The show was incredible and i you know and though again those sort of things don't come along very often i've been going to the shepherd's bush empire for 25 years it's one of the top five best shows i've ever been to there if not number one right and there is a dvd version of this document of the of the performance that you can go away and, uh, and buy if you're inspired by this chat and that's that's really good as well um but that's peak Pre Grammy Amy madness, right? It, this was where you, if you were a fan, I suppose, again, it's a bit like being a fan of um, any artist when they're on the cusp of success, and you can see you can see it all happening. You know, I saw it with Oasis. Um, Adele had a really fun 
moment where you could see that everything was coming together. And it's nice when you um, can sort of be a part of those things as a fan because it, essentially you've beaten the the general public. You've, you you're you're an early adopter, right? Right. It's a bit like being into Nirvana when they're on Sub Pop, as I'm sure you know. Well, I played with them the day their album went gold. <laughs> so that was a weird trip. It was my band, then Bud Honey and Nirvana. And we were all in the audience going, what is happening right now? This is so weird to see a band like Nirvana, who are just a regional band that no one thought would get to be known worldwide, to see an audience heartfelt screaming lyrics back to a band like that first time i'd ever seen something like that in the yeah. underground an underground band where people were you know just beatlemania level passion of course now it makes sense you're like yeah they're incredible if you think about you know the jump off point that was what you just described or or even a little bit of amy because you're we're now looking at it through the lens of 2024 you know it's so much easier to use tiktok or streaming or a video or whatever that thing is to yeah. blow yourself up if you if the music is good and the artist has charisma and the chops you understand it but you look back at say the nirvana thing or the smashing pumpkins or an act that really blew up it's it's fascinating because you have you you had that there were different tools being used like for me in, in the uk everything was being driven by the music press right so it would have been enemy melody maker and i also liked a magazine called select and they all they all told the story but they weren't although they were sort of championing bands like suede over here it wasn't they weren't break. you know you can't credit melody maker with breaking nirvana they're reacting to the music and they're amplifying the music. They're not right. creating wildfire. I do think later that there definitely became a point where, you know, if you had the right writer with the right band and the right cover image, that could create the perfect storm. So if you had, say, I, you know, like there was no question that Liam and Noel Gallagher were, were dynamite to interview together if they were in the right mood. And with, with Nirvana, you know, Select Magazine covered Nirvana a lot. But also Kurt was really, he was smart and he was charismatic and he Absolutely. always looked good, even when he always looked like he was a fully formed rock star, right? I know, it's this wild. Something that I'm, that, that I'm, you know, Amy sort of came out of the womb, a fully formed pop star. No one could tell her what to wear. Uh, my unna one of my one of the people I spoke to at Universal said, you know, you couldn't tell her what to do or say or what to wear, and if she didn't like a question, she'd roll her eyes. She knew exactly what she wanted to be, and right. And I'm sure you can say the same. You know, Nirvana didn't suddenly start wearing smarter clothes as a result of having more money. If anything, it probably made them more entrenched to be. They wanted a, probably a, a level of normality in the madness of everything else. So you can see when artists, you know, if you look at Adele now, Adele has been completely um, Vegasified, and right. and that's uh, it's it's not a criticism as more as much as it's an observation. I wonder whether, and you know, because she was part of that early Camden thing as well. Like people forget that, you know. I wonder what the Adele of now would look at the Adele of, you know her first couple of singles, you know, she's, she's been started. She's almost like an English Barbara Streisand now. Does the UK press to have the same power that it did back in the eighties and nineties? No. So look, I, I started my career, at a magazine called music and it wasn't the biggest dance magazine, but I always thought it was the best. Mm -hmm. So we would be selling 40, 50,000 copies a month. And then the, the nearest competitor, which was mix mag, would probably sell double that. But it's a bit like the disdain that Kurt Cobain would have had to acts that either copied them or copied the style or sure. were bigger but not necessarily cooler, right? That's the that's that's where I think life gets interesting with the navigation. 
But what music did was if we put an artist on the cover, we were crowning them. So if we put okay. Daft Punk on the cover, we were making a statement. And none of the acts that we put on the cover at the beginning were megastars. They were... So it was about putting the right cover artist with the right cover image on the cover at the right time. And that's, I think, what the, uh, you know, Enemy and Melody Maker were very good at that. In the 90s, Melody Maker really had Nirvana and Pearl Jam. Okay. Um, Enemy kind of had everyone else because a bit like what I was saying about Mix Mag and music, Enemy was like the number one. So if you're a public, if you're a publicist and you had an hour with Madonna, you were not going to give it to Melody Maker. You were going to give it to Enemy, and they did. And then I think what you then had because probably an artist would only say I'm doing one bit of press. If Madonna was doing one bit of press, she would she might choose say Q magazine, or the publicist who's a lady called Barbara Shiro might say I want you to do something a bit more left of center let's do enemy it's not your heartland but it's a statement so yes at this point you've got and when i first went to en- enemy I-, I saw this they had so much power that there was a little bit of um there was definitely a bit of fuck you to people they didn't like or the publicists who were annoying them they had so much power it was sort of fascinating to see and if they damned an album they gave your album four out of ten and you were say morrissey they probably if i you know if you were that artist and you've been given four out of ten probably ruin the rest of your month and it would affect your sales because if they said the new pearl jam album sucks two out of ten that's going to affect sales now right if you or i basically talked about you know a new album by any artist now and we said it's good or it's not good it just doesn't have the same sway anymore because um Number one, unfortunately, most print magazines have gone. Number two, everyone has an opinion now. Yes. And number three, if anything, the scariest bit is a magazine used to have a shelf life of either a week if it was a print press or a month if it was a magazine. You, if you're un, if you're really unlucky, it comes and goes in twenty four hours now. Right. Well, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you know, since you manage artists, there's kind of two things I wanted to cover that are, are happened in the film. One is Nick, her manager, basically saying, I was too close to Amy. I shouldn't have been her friend. I should have been her manager. And the other is basically, you know, her mom saying, I did not parent her. Amy was saying, why don't you say no to me? Why aren't you harder on me? And at one point, one of her bodyguards says she needed just someone to say no to her. What is the relationship with an artist, do you feel like you can say no? I mean, I've worked with people where I've seen in certain parties, people just don't say no to the person who is the main focus of the art. I, I guess the, the 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 blunt answer is it depends. Mm-hmm. If an artist is driven by money, which Amy clearly wasn't, if you offer them um, an, an insane amount of money, they may well do it because the money is so you know obscene that saying no just seems like the worst option but amy wasn't driven by things like that she probably if you asked her do you know how many copies your album sold in the uk i would imagine her answer would be i don't know there's a bit where she talks about justin timberlake and she isn't aware yes of like she and, and none of this is bad it just shows you where she cared about the art and you know that that but that was a, a a funny example. Like if Justin Timberlake had said, "Let's do a record," she'd have gone, "Fuck no!" Right? That would have been her response. Right. But to go back to your your question, you know, it's art and commerce which drive things, isn't it? Ultimately, in music, you know, you can you can be a cottage industry indie indie artist and just tour the UK, or you can jump up a level and sign to Polydor or rough trade or whatever that label is that you had is your sort of secret thing and then once you've got a platform and 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 you've got a certain to a certain level of success suddenly things come at you and you have to basically go is this good for me is this good for my career you know in the uk there are there are lots of people that will go to there's a phrase they'd go to the opening of an envelope right and that's 
that's not about anything that except I suppose I ought to be seen here because it's good for my career or I might meet someone or, or this producer of this person of this thing is going to be there, you know. But ultimately, some of that stuff is just what I call nonsense. You know, it's probably better to just not go out to some of these things. There, there are things in her life that that once you're being offered headline gigs, is it Helsinki, that gig at the end where she really comes unstuck? It was Serbia. Yes, that's it. So it was Exit Festival in Serbia, I guess. And it, and ultimately, what will have driven that will have been, it's so much money, we cannot say no. <laughs> right. But then, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, you now go, okay, but clearly she wasn't in any mental fit state to have been there and she didn't want to be there either. What's right. interesting is that there are things in the film where even though she's really troubled, she can she can turn it on, right? There's a lot of footage where it's her coming out with blood on her face and, you know, it's all paparazzi footage. And then it just cuts to her singing at a big award show with someone playing acoustic guitar. It's just acoustic guitar and her voice. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, she could turn it on. It was incredible. I guess, but I guess the, the, the final thing on that is, well, you know, when you're in the eye of the storm, which is clearly what you have here, you have to make decisions very quickly. If it's like, here's something we can look at, but we need to make a decision. This has been going on for decades, right? It's like, do you want to do you want to go to this awards show? Do you want to do this thing? Do you want to play in front of the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Do you want to go and support Jean-Michel Jarre by the pyramids? And you have to basically, and, and they're all they're all in the eye of the storm and they all have to figure out whether it's good. For, you know, th there are clearly people that are important to her and there are also clearly people that are not important to her. And you see this time and time again. So as, as she, she's a very, the, the word that you have to use, she, she has a very pure experience of music and uh, a very pure attitude to music. So it's not driven by, I must make a record with this person because it's good for my career. It's, you know, there's really, she really only has one ultimate hero, doesn't, doesn't she? And she meets him. Incredible. It's so lovely. <laughs> He's so kind. He's just like, Amy, it's all right. You're good. It's You're... so wholesome, it isn't is. it? It's so beautiful. Even the scene where she wins the Grammy. I mean, she was up against Beyonce, the Foo Fighters, Rihanna, Justin Timberlake and her album. And showing her when Tony Bennett comes out to give the award away. And she's on stage and she's like, Dad, Dad, Tony Bennett. Like, she's just freaked out watching him. Yeah. On a screen coming out to be something she's part of. You just know that she, she's like, that's a true hero for her. It's a it's like one of her top three. And it's lovely because it's lovely because it's easy to be a fan of Beyonce or Madonna or someone in hip hop or someone in R&B. It's easy to be to be a fan of a superstar because they've made it to the top of the mountain. But Tony Bennett, he was sort of like. You know, he wasn't as big as Frank Sinatra, but he was probably the aficionado's better version of Frank Sinatra. And of course, that's yes. why she went for him. And that's why he meant so much to her. Yeah. Early in the film, she says, my heroes are Dinah Washington, Sarah Vaughan, yeah. Monk and Tony Bennett. Yes. Like, you know, when she's like 20, he's the reason I do this. And he's the only one of the people that you've mentioned who at this point is still alive. And then ironically, he then outlives her. So yes, it's so amazing that he, that like you said, he puts her at ease. She is able to deliver that day. But I mean, poor, poor Amy must have just been going through hoops leading up to that. Oh my it's God. a bit like, you know, trying to, it's a bit like a sports person hoping they're going to win the gold. Like it's probably meant as much to her as, Winning, it, it, I mean, that is her equivalent of winning a gold medal working with Tony Bennett. Absolutely. It's the highlight of her life. It's the high water mark. And he has really lovely insight into her, too, just in terms of he's worked with a lot of artists. And he says, you know, some of the most famous people I know were the most nervous. And, you know, she was a natural jazz singer and he just had so much respect for her. It's also amazing. This is a time where, yes, they have to be in the studio together. Nowadays, they'd be like, OK, Amy, you record over in the UK. Yeah. Tony will be here. You know, it's too dangerous to fly with COVID or whatever. And we'll just 
comp it together, just send us a bunch of versions. To see them together, basically every time they record the song, they interact with each other differently. They're doing it differently. They're figuring it out. It was just a, such a beautiful moment, you know, especially since this is later in her life. It's possibly the, my favorite part of the whole documentary because they're, they're two artists who recognize each other's artistry, but they're both, it's, a, it's what you call in life a win-win. He's happy to be in the room with her. She's obviously happy to be in the room with him, but they're both delighted to be there. And so they bring out the best in each other. It's it's which is very different to, you know, a TikTok song featuring four artists and nine songwriters and 12 different publishers. You know, it's 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 back to the pure thing. And he probably recognized something in her that he saw very, very rarely. Yeah, he 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 mentioned that, didn't he? So yeah, I mean, I I I go to a lot of shows, and I went to see him once at the Royal Albert Hall. It's the only time I've ever noticed at eight o'clock he came on eight p.m. on the dot right. on pro. He he flew us to the moon, and at nine fifteen, the show was over, and I just thought we just got Tony Bennett because Tony Bennett is old school jazz royalty an old school jazz royalty unless you're miles davis comes on if it's like the shows at eight you're on at eight none of this like it's 9 45 we need another hour or axel rose it's 11 o'clock is it time to go on he's on at eight right. never i've never seen anything like it before or since but also by the time by the time i saw him he was like he must have been 90 so I, I, you're also watching a 90 year old legend rock the stage but, you know, he's also, uh, uh, after an hour and 15 minutes at 90, you know, that's your lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of time, I wanted to ask you about, you know, we Back to Black, it's 35 minutes long. Yeah, it's really short, cool, isn't it? It's just incredible. Um, it's hit after hit on it. And but it's a short album, and that kind of freaks me out. You know, like when I heard Rehab, I didn't know that this was autobiographical. I didn't know much about Amy Winehouse when I first heard it over here in the States. Right. You just think like, oh, she's really witty and she's got a really wicked sense of humor and she's smart and she's really open. But I did, I had no idea this film, you know, obviously I found that out before I saw the film, but the film also does a really amazing job of showing her handwritten poetry, really. And like, you know, she's drawing like stars and hearts around her lyrics, you know, if it's about Blake or whatever. But they're so cutting and so honest i kind of feel like people don't really talk about her lyrics as much just wanted to see if you had a favorite amy winehouse lyric or song that just destroys you or you just think is just an incredible turn of phrase i mean i'm always going to say rehab because not only is there a point where jay-z then comes along and jumps on a version of it uh, interestingly he didn't approve talking of approvals he didn't approve his version of rehab to be on the film because he didn't think it was good enough. You know, what we're talking about is, you know, she she's fiercely autobiographical with her lyrics. So, you know, if she's happy, that might come out. And if she's upset, that's also going to come out. Yeah, I think you're right to mention that lyrically she's possibly a bit um, underappreciated. It's just that everything else comes before that, doesn't it? You know, right. Brian Adams does a couple of really good shoots with her. But the reality is, by by 2010, there probably isn't an artist in the world who doesn't want to meet her. I met her briefly in St. Lucia the day after that jazz festival. Uh, I was with my best friend Naomi, and I just she was she was at a bar where we were at, and I introduced myself, and she she shook my hand and said, "Hello, I'm Amy." And I thought, gosh, even though there are paparazzi hiding in the bushes somewhere on the next island, and they were. I guess she was just trying to lead a normal existence wherever that was going to be. Amazing. I don't think we'll ever have an artist now who would be subjected to as much stress and nonsense as Amy experienced sort of in her short life, right? I don't think the world mm. would wouldn't it wouldn't be okay with some of this stuff anymore, you know? The the biggest the biggest artist kickback I've seen in recent years was the, there's a singer called Ray 
who I think everyone knows now. She's done a track with Beyonce on her new record. She famously left Universal after they wouldn't let her release an album. Um, and she took to social media to, to you know, to, to basically say, I've had enough. Amy Winehouse obviously didn't have or probably wouldn't have even wanted to have used um, Twitter. <laughs> um, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, in many ways. Don't you think in many ways that all she probably wanted in life was spend time with her family, spend time with her friends and a partner and just make music like everything else was just like stuff that got in the way wasn't it yeah so there's a bit you know going back to the music the end really talks about the fact that she wanted to make an album she wanted to make a more hip-hop flavored record didn't she she was talking about um yeah, with quest love quest love and most death and yeah the quest love thing i mean yeah so poor quest love will have a big what if around this for the rest of his life. Going, I'd forgotten about that till I rewatched the film. I was like, wait, how come I haven't thought about that more? Yeah. I mean, it, it's really passing. It's very short. Yeah, it's it's such a loss. Um, and I do feel like the film is really uncomfortable in terms of it's unflinching. The fact that they have so much personal footage of her with people she trusts really gives you an amazing insight to how delightful she was, how smart she was, how funny she was, how full of life she was. And just those scenes where she's like showing her friend around her first apartment and just making fun of things. I mean, like, this is a kitchen yeah. <laughs> in this accent. It's like, it's just youth magnified in this film. It's, it's just, I forget how young she is in this. She was a kid. She was a kid. And although there's obviously some very harrowing scenes around heroin, when she's sort of happy and playful, she's like a teenage girl. Like when she's ringing like Salam and, or any of the producers saying, hiya, you don't forget about me or any of that stuff. She's just being a teenage girl checking in with people that, you know, she misses or whatever. It's, it's, yeah. it's not a Hallmark movie, right? It's not a Hallmark version of her life. That's what, so many music documentaries that are endorsed or bankrolled by big companies end up being because I guess you don't want or someone in the brain trust doesn't want any bad words said about X, Y or Z. So let's not let's not do that. It really doesn't. That's the that's what it does so well. Do we need to talk about the fact that her, you know, her dad then said we must make Reclaiming Amy? Yeah, I mean, she obviously loved her dad and there was a complicated relationship. You know, he, he was having an affair for like eight or nine years before he even left the family house. And it really, you know, split her up. There is no question that he loves his daughter and that she loves him. Yeah. In Reclaiming Amy, one of her friends says something like, maybe he didn't realize that ringing a radio station to tell his side of the story was always a good idea. So I guess what, to use a very modern phrase, maybe that was oversharing. <laughs> You've seen the film then? You've seen Reclaiming? Yeah, it's, it's like an hour long documentary. Is it good? I mean, what what is it really? I think that if you think about what so many artists have now, which is like a brain trust or, you know, who the, the people who look after the legacy, whether that's Michael Jackson or Prince, um... You know, they, they. I don't think they thought it was a fair representation of the Amy that, that they remembered. I mean, if you think about it, if you're playing Exit Festival or you're flying around the world, her mum, for example, isn't doing... She's at some other things, but her mum is not on tour relentlessly like, you know, a young artist would be whatever point of their career. So that they, they, you know, her friends... Some of her friends are in Reclaiming Amy, talking about the Amy that, that they knew. So while I don't, while I think it, it, it's a bit biased towards the cuddly side of her life, I suppose. Um, it's not, it's not as important a piece of work to me as say the Amy film is, right? Absolutely happy that they've made it, but I'm, I sort of think that that in many ways this the Amy film 
is a big learning lesson for everyone when you're dealing with and this could be true of a sports person it could be true of a musician when you become in the eye of the storm in a situation in life and you become you know not only the biggest the most popular but also everybody wants a piece of you you know i grew up i grew up quite liking tennis and i watched um uh, you know, I always watch tennis documentaries because I find them interesting. I watched a John McEnroe one recently. Oh, yeah, sure. He's he's utterly unhappy with being John McEnroe, right? Absolutely. Hates it. Yes. And and yet, if you're a casual punter going, oh, you, you're a millionaire, your life must be great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm blatantly comparing Paul, uh, these two. I'm comparing like apples to oranges here, but tennis to troubadours but she was happiest making music with musical foils like salam or mark ronson who brought out yes. the best in her and made her feel complete as an artist the end yeah absolutely ralph i really appreciate it so much uh, i was really heartfelt all your insight thank you for coming on i've loved it i should probably say that i'm about to start working on my my sort of journey through dance music print so i'm writing my first book what you had in the 90s just to end was so the first magazine i worked for was music as i mentioned before music formed the guy who gave me my job a guy called ben turner who now manages people like richie horton he worked for melody maker and so melody maker and enemy would both do um two pages a week on dance music right so enemy had vibes and melody maker had orbit and in a month, that's not a lot of pages, right? Two pages is not a but lot. In the for... mid nineties, you know, none of those artists would ever be covered. Like Underworld, were not going to get the cover of Enemy. Okay, They'd eventually get Melody Maker. Okay, I think probably eventually got there. But this was a this was a countercultural subculture that was bubbling through. You know, ironically, on the on the commercial side, we were starting to see Euro dance records in American house records become hits so like you know although they were cheesy they were you know redneck cotton eye joke went to number one i like to move it huge record across europe um right T todd terry people like that they were you know but they they were not they to be blunt they you know a lot of these artists were from chicago and detroit so they weren't natural cover stars for melody maker or enemy but to credit the teams there was something in the water that made them put Felix the House Cat, Carl Craig, Sasha, or the Orb, any of these people, they they got a page, right? And that was, and so at some point, Ben and another guy called Push, who he worked with, launched Music Magazine because they could see that the club thing, particularly in the UK and across Europe, and obviously Ibiza, um, was not was not as tiny as say sub pop was right it was right it was clubs who were booking star djs you know the clubs were becoming brands because the club brands were touring the world you suddenly had people like paul oakenfold who was probably like the first superstar dj who was also flirting with being a brand because he had a label called perfecto and they had jackets and they would tour so essentially what what i got to experience was an industry bubbling and figuring out its route to market in front of my eyes. And some of the things that I saw were obviously extremely formative. Um, you know, like the, I went to tribal gathering in 1995 and I met the chemical brothers who were lovely. Right. And I still, I still work with them and chat to them to this day. So it's, a you know, back to what you were saying about Peter Buck, it's lovely when the people that you admire don't turn out to be ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> because not everyone is fantastic because I, so you know he's you know what i loved about your peter buck episode was beyond my adventures in dance music print and yours at sub pop what you had was a very pure communication a bit like the clash did where you could write or send something and a bit like having a pen friend in france or germany they'd write back yes right Absolutely. Amazing. It was so amazing that that they would write back. Incredible. Now, again, you're only going to write back if you care. And they're 
if you care and I guess you you care enough to because you didn't know them, did you? Right? No, <laughs> no. no they would never been. The, they'd never toured Portland, Oregon yet. They were like, we hope to get there someday. It's like REM were like, what's Oregon at yeah, this point? <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Now, it's what Stan Lee did incredibly well at the beginning of Marvel days. He figured out that the best way to keep young kids interested in Marvel beyond the characters was you had the Marvel bullpen. And if people wrote, you printed the letters. And once in a while, right. someone would write in and, you know, they go, actually, John, that's a really good point you made. We didn't think about that. Just the best. It's the equivalent of having a badge from, in the UK, we had, we had a show called Blue Peter. Like, it's oh yeah, it's like it's like anything that's like that or, or becoming yes. or becoming a member of the scout team or, or the scouts. And, you know, the, the someone in that goes, come over here, Sonny. You've done well. Let's have it. You know, you, it's val yeah. validation, isn't it? That's what it is. Yeah. Well, and I think we're both fellow travelers in this and this. And uh, I love that, you know, we started at such a young age putting those pictures on our wall and dreaming and that we're in it. It's just fascinating. Um, I, I count my blessings all the time. Well, I'm, I think that's a perfect way to end today, Chris. Thank you so much, Ralph. It was so good to see you. We'll do it again soon, okay? Have a good day. Thank you for listening to Revolutions Per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday. We are a completely independently produced affair, so the best way to support us is to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app and to subscribe to our Patreon over at patreon.com slash revolutionspermovie where you can get exclusive weekly bonus episodes every Sunday, as well as one-of-a-kind handmade Revolutions Per Movie goods that I send out to you. You can follow the show on social media at Revolutions Per Movie and find more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye! <laughs>